Uh, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, thank you uh, all for uh, coming. It's a pleasure to um, introduce our uh, speaker and also the topic for today. But before I do that, um, let me uh, let ev everyone know that this is co-sponsored by the Griswold Center for Economics Policy at uh, Princeton and also the Judas Rabinowitz Center for Public Policy and Finance at SPIA. Um, this event is also being uh, recorded. So if you have to say something, uh, just say wisely. Um, <laughs> The, the, the topic of our uh, uh, talk today could not be more timely. Everybody is um, aware of uh, sort of uh, the geopolitics around supply shortages, and in particular, supply shortages uh, in recent times on around uh, microchips and the importance of Taiwan in that context. And this is just in the broader context of what economists are increasingly calling supply side uh, macro policy, uh, industrial policy is back in fashion. And so these are all very timely and topical questions. And I'm absolutely delighted that we have an expert to talk to us on that important subject. Um, uh, Chris Miller, he is the um, author of the recent book, Chip War, The Fight for the World's Most Critical Technology. Um, he is an associate professor of international history at Fletcher School of Law at Tufts. Uh, his research focuses on technology, geopolitics, economics, all the good stuff that we need to know about today. Um, he is also, another uh, timely and topical question, he's also the author of three other books on Russia. So he's kind of cornered the market for everything that is important, um, including Putinomics, Power and Money in Resurgent Russia. We shall be masters, Russia's pivots to East Asia from Peter the Great to Putin, and the struggle to save Soviet economy, Mikhail Gorbachev, and the collapse of the USSR. Um, he has previously served as the associate director of Brady Johnson program at Grand Strategy at Yale, a lecturer at the New Economic School at Moscow, a visiting researcher at Carnegie Moscow Center, a research associate at Brookings, and a fellow at the German Marshall Fund. Uh, Transatlantic Academy. He received his PhD and MA from Yale and his BA in history from Harvard. Thank you, welcome. Thank you very much. Well, thank you again for the invitation. I'm delighted uh, to be here. It's been uh, several years since I've been at Princeton, so very nice uh, to be back with, um, with such a great audience. Um, People often ask me how it is that, uh, as a historian of Russia, uh, I came to write about semiconductors, uh, which indeed is something uh, of a puzzle. But what I'd like to do is start by explaining uh, my intellectual journey to write a book uh, called Chip War, which I think will not only uh, shed light on why I'm here speaking to you, uh, but also, uh, I hope, convince you that semiconductors are not just important for the current debate about supply shocks, although they've been in the news uh, a lot in recent years, in, instead of uh, what I'd like to suggest to you is that semiconductors are actually key to understanding power in the modern world. Because uh, over the past 75 years, power, military power, economic power, uh, technological influence has been reshaped by computing. And at the core of all computing are tiny silicon chips. Now, I, I began uh, this research uh, around 2015 when I set out with the research puzzle about the arms race during the Cold War. The puzzle I wanted to understand was why was it that both the United States and the Soviet Union could, during the first couple decades of the Cold War, produce the critical military technologies of the early Cold War arms race, nuclear weapons and long-range delivery systems, which were hard things to produce, but both countries did so. By the end of the Cold War, though, the situation was radically different. The United States had jumped ahead in military power by devising weapons that could strike with a fair amount of precision over long distances, dozens, even hundreds of miles by the Cold War and a capability that was demonstrated uh, in a way that shocked the world in the Persian Gulf War of 1991. Even the US military hadn't really understood the implications of its new precision strike technologies by the end of the Cold War. The Soviets uh, were in some ways shocked to see the results of US precision weaponry in 1991, but there were a number of people inside the Soviet system who were actually not surprised at all. And chief among them were some of the key figures in the Soviet general staff who had been writing for almost a decade by the end of the 1980s about the ways that computing capabilities were transforming warfare, the ways in which this was letting America jump ahead of the Soviet Union in terms of the production of military power, 
and by implication, the ways that the Soviet Union is falling hopelessly behind. Now, the Soviet general staff somewhat unexpectedly realized far in advance of the Pentagon the ways that computing capabilities were uh, transforming warfare. It wasn't until the 1990s that uh, the U.S. military establishment began writing about a revolution in military affairs, which is a phrase that appears often in uh, U.S. defense uh, theoretical discourse in the 1990s and 2000s. The combination of advanced sensors, communications technologies that let you network different devices on a battlefield, and the ability to de deploy computing in lots of different devices so that they can be guided efficiently uh, towards their target. As I began to study this shift in U.S. military power, this revolution in military affairs that was first theorized by the Soviets and then later realized by uh, American defense planners, it became clear that the key technologies undergirding this shift weren't uh, technologies that had to be any given type of system. It wasn't missiles that flew farther per se or planes that flew faster. The key technological shift was computing power that was distributed across battlefields in ways that had previously been unexpected. Computing power was the transformative force applied to military systems that explains why militaries fought differently in 1990 than they had in 1960. No one in 1960, having seen a fighter jet or a tank or an artillery piece, would have struggled to rec recognize what these weapon systems are. But they would have been shocked to know what's inside of them, what capabilities they have, the communications capabilities, the sensing capabilities, the capabilities to process and remember data. And so it seemed to me that you couldn't actually understand the history of military power without putting shifts in computing capabilities at your center. So then I asked, well, what produces computing capabilities? Why was it that the United States could produce a lot of computing and the Soviet Union couldn't? Yeah. The, in the late Soviet Union, there was a joke, uh, an anecdote, uh, of which the Soviets had uh, a large number about a uh, very uh, diligent party secretary who'd been focusing on uh, computing technologies. And he came up to the general secretary and said, comrade, comrade, we've made the world's largest microprocessor. And, and that anecdote spoke to the Soviet Union's love of making large things, but it also spoke to a fundamental reality that the Soviet Union was miles behind when it came to the ability to miniaturize computing power by the end of the Cold War. And this presented another puzzle because both the United States and the Soviet Union had realized by the late 1950s that miniaturizing computing would be fundamental to future military technologies. The United States Defense Department and NASA poured billions of dollars into computing in the late 50s and early 60s precisely to miniaturize it. The first computers, uh, as many of you probably are well aware, made up entire rooms. For example, the uh, UK computers at Bletchley Park that cracked Nazi codes during World War II were the size of garages. Yeah. The ENIAC computer at the University of Pennsylvania during World War II that calculated artillery trajectories was also the size of a massive room. But if you wanted to guide a missile to its target, you had to have miniaturized computing. And that's exactly what the Defense Department tried to fund uh, in the early Cold War. In the process, they made possible the creation of new devices called semiconductors or integrated circuits to be uh, more technically uh, precise. And integrated circuits were simple devices. They were a piece of silicon that had multiple switches on them that turned circuits on or off, on or off. These switches are called transistors. They were invented actually not too far down the road in Bell Labs in 1947. But the ability to put multiple transistors on a given piece of silicon reduced failure rates and let you miniaturize them in a way that was uh, unforeseen at the time and has been unparalleled in human history. The first integrated circuits that were produced uh, and purchased uh, by the U.S. government were put into military systems. The Apollo spacecraft guidance computer was the first large-scale order for semiconductors in the early 1960s. The second large-scale order was for the guidance computer on the Minuteman II intercontinental ballistic missile that was intended to send nuclear warheads from the United States to the Soviet Union. And so there's been a deep interrelationship between defense industrial demands and advances in semiconductor technology since the earliest days of the Cold War. What then struck me was the extent to which the number of transistors on chips had grown dramatically since the late 1950s when the first chips were invented. The first commercially valuable chip in the early 1960s had four transistors on it, four switches that could turn on and off, remembering or processing four ones or four zeros at the same time. And I learned over the course of my research that if you go to the Apple store and buy a new smartphone, just one of the chips, the chip that operates the operating system, on a new smartphone will have 15 billion, with a B, billion transistors on it. 
So from four to 15 billion uh, in just about 60 years. That seemed to me uh, to be a fact that was in some ways obvious, all I did was Google it. But in other ways, historians had not remotely begun to reckon with because there's no other part of the economy that has delivered such tremendous productivity gains year after year um, that is remotely comparable. In 1965, Gordon Moore, who was one of the early figures in the industry, founded Fairchild Semiconductor and later go on to found Intel, uh, predicted that the number of transistors per chip, so the amount of processing power per chip, would double every year or so. And he thought that that trend would last from 1965 to 1975. Turns out it's lasted all the way up to the present day. Every year or two, the number of transistors per chip doubles, giving us a doubling of processing power and chips that are twice as capable as a result. So I like to think, what other part of the economy works in that way? <laughs> I sort of imagine if airplanes flew twice as fast every two years, or houses could be built every two years twice as large at the same yeah. cost. There's nothing that comes close. Nothing that comes close. No other type of technology has remotely comparable exponential growth curves that last nearly as long, over half a century. Now, I had heard of Moore's Law when I began this research, but I hadn't had really begun to think through the implications of what that meant as computing capabilities became more powerful and cheaper and could therefore be deployed across society. The first chips, uh, as I mentioned, were made for missile guidance systems, then they were deployed in, uh, in mainframe computers, the types that corporations or uh, governments were used. But today, we rely on chips for almost all aspects mm -hmm. of our daily lives. You wake up in the morning, your alarm clock has semiconductors inside of it, turn on your coffee maker, there's semiconductors inside of there, refrigerators, dishwashers, microwaves, they all rely on semiconductors today. It's in your car, if it's a new car, it'll have a thousand or so chips inside of it. Some chips are very simple, moving the window up and down. Some chips very complex, managing the semi-autonomous driving features. Even before you look at your smartphone, you're relying on hundreds, probably thousands of chips every single day. And when you pick up your smartphone and touch the screen to light it up, you end up relying on some of the most complex chips humans have ever made. Advanced smartphones today use some of the most sophisticated semiconductors uh, around. And today, uh, a, a typical smartphone will have billions, tens of billions in some cases, of transistors inside of it. And to fit tens of billions of transistors inside of a smartphone, they need to be made very, very small. And what I came to realize over the course of my research is that the process of manufacturing transistors at miniature scale is the most complex manufacturing process humans have ever undertaken. In order to fit 15 billion transistors in a chip the size of your fingernail, each one of them has to be smaller than the size of a coronavirus. And you have to manufacture by the billions every single day with basically perfect accuracy. There's room for a couple of errors in your 15 billion transistor budget. There's some error correction mechanisms you can use to get around a couple of mistakes, but there's not much room for error. Which means that the process of manufacturing semiconductors is not only the most miniaturized, it's also one of the most accurate because the scope for errors is so low. So then I asked, well, how do they do that? How do, how do they produce these chips? And it turns out that it requires one of the most complex supply chains of precision machinery, software tools, and chemicals uh, ever produced. A supply chain that stretches from the Netherlands, through the United States, to Japan, uh, to Taiwan, Taiwan, where today the Taiwan Semiconductor Manufacturing Company produces 90% of the world's most advanced processor chips, and over one-third of the new computing power the world adds each year. Almost all of that, including all the advanced production, is produced by one company in just a couple of facilities arrayed on the western shores of Taiwan, each one of which ranks among the most expensive factories ever built. And this is the only company in the world that can produce many of the critical chips on which our society and our economy depend fundamentally. And the company is? TSMC, the Taiwan Semiconductor Manufacturing Company. <coughs> so how, does, how do they make chips? <laughs> well, it turns out they have to buy machine tools from companies in a number of critical uh, uh, countries. In the Netherlands, there's one company that produces a type of tool called an extreme ultraviolet lithography tool, without which no advanced chips could be made today, thanks to which all of you have acquired semiconductors that would otherwise be impossible to produce. So to make an advanced semiconductor, uh, the first step 
each <coughs> of often 2,000 or so process steps involved is to take a silicon wafer, a big piece of silicon, and shine light at it through a mask. And sort of like a, how a Halloween mask will let light go through certain parts and not through others, you have the pattern of transistors you want on that mask. Light shines through and reacts with chemicals that you've laid out in the silicon wafer uh, to carve the shapes you want that produce transistors. Now in the past, in the early days of the chip industry, we used visible light to undertake this lithography process, printing with light. But visible light has wavelengths of several hundred nanometers, depending on which color you're talking about. But on your smartphone, the transistors have features that are often just a couple dozen nanometers in dimension. So visible light is far too broad a brush with which to paint when we're making advanced chips. That's why for the most advanced production of semiconductors, we rely on extreme ultraviolet light, light with a wavelength of 13.5 nanometers, which is fine enough to carve the shapes that are needed to produce advanced transistors on the chips inside, for example, of your smartphone. To produce extreme ultraviolet light, which is right next to the X-ray uh, light in the, in the light spectrum, and so it's difficult to reflect because X-ray goes through machines. To produce this light, you undertake the following steps. First, you have balls of tin, around 30 microns, millions of meters, falling, uh, falling through a vacuum. Then you pulverize the tin with two blasts from one of the most powerful lasers ever deployed in a commercial device. The ball of tin explodes into a plasma, measuring 40 times hotter than the surface of a sun. The plasma emits light at just the right wavelength, 13.5 <coughs> nanometers. It's collected by a dozen of the flattest mirrors humans have ever made. Each one of these machines have the flattest mirrors humans have ever made and reflected onto the silicon wafer, carves the transistors that go into your smartphone. It's the most complex manufacturing ever made. And this machine, uh, in order to produce light with this level of precision and power, is the most complex machine tool ever made. Costs $150 million a piece, requires multiple 747s to move, and has so many components, the company that makes it, ASML in the Netherlands, doesn't know how many components are inside. I've asked them. What they know is that the laser component, which is produced by a German company called Trumpf, has 457,000 components inside, and that's just one of the systems inside an EV machine. So this is the most complex uh, manufactured good with possibly the exception of a wide-body aircraft uh, humans have ever made. But the precision involved, uh, precision required to produce this light is far higher uh, than in aviation. And you need one of these machines if you want to make an advanced semiconductor that's commercially viable. Simply impossible to do it in a commercially viable way otherwise. And this is just one of the types of machines that you need to make an advanced ship. There are also machines that uh, deposit thin films of materials just a couple of atoms thick or etch canyons in the silicon just a couple of atoms wide. And without these machines, you can't make a semiconductor remotely close to the cutting edge. These machines are produced basically by five companies, one in the Netherlands, three in California, one in Japan. Almost uh, no other countries have anything close to the machining capability of what's present in the U.S., uh, parts of Europe, uh, and Japan. And so although Taiwan has the most advanced manufacturing capabilities for semiconductors, Taiwan itself is critically reliant on the importation of machine tools, of which it produces basically none domestically, from Japan, the United States, and the Netherlands. <coughs> Suddenly, the, as I began to study how you make a semiconductor, the, the image of a supply chain, of which we've talked a lot about, people talk about supply chains, but what is a supply chain really? Well, suddenly it began to become clear. A supply chain is the need to buy machines from the Netherlands and deposition machines from California, and etching machines from California, and furnaces from Japan, put them together in a factory in Taiwan. They need to source your chemicals. Your chemicals in chip making must be ultra pure, ultra pure, 99.999, because if there's any error in your chemicals, couple molecules that shouldn't be there. You have vast errors in your chip making. So you need to source your chemicals largely from Japanese firms that have unique capabilities to purify the relevant chemicals. Bring them together in your chip making facility in Taiwan to produce advanced semiconductors. The process of making advanced chips is, uh, is I, I hope I've convinced you, pretty cool. Um, yeah. <laughs> it's, it's also very expensive. Uh -huh. <laughs> And it's also very fragile because across the supply chain, there are critical choke points that are controlled by a handful, or in some cases, just one firm. There's no one else in the world that can produce EUV lithography machines except for ASML. No one else is even trying. And no one else will for the next decade because it's so complex, so hard to do. There's a couple companies trying to produce advanced semiconductors trying to rival TSMC in Taiwan. Samsung of South Korea right. is close behind, although volumes are much smaller. Intel 
The United States is further behind still, but trying to catch up. But beyond those three, no one else is trying uh, with any sort of uh, viability to produce advanced logic chips. There's three firms there. When it comes to the deposition machinery or the etching equipment, it's often two companies that are able to produce cutting edge chips. If you want to design chips, you have to buy software from three companies uh, that have, and all three of them you need in almost all cases, uh, their software tools. So across the supply chain, there's a series of really unique monopolies or oligopolies that define the semiconductor supply chain, which creates some economic vulnerabilities, you could argue, in case there was an earthquake in the wrong region, for example. But the primary vulnerability or the primary point of pressure on the structure of semiconductor supply chains today is, is not economic, despite the news headlines of the past several years. In fact, the quote-unquote semiconductor shortages of 2020 and 2021 were, actually came amid a period of rapid growth in semiconductor production. Chip production grew by 8% wow. in 2020 and then by double-digit rates in 2021. So what we've saw, actually seen over the last few years is a demand surge rather than a semiconductor shortage. As everyone began working from home in the pandemic, they bought a lot more PCs, companies upgraded their data centers, demand surged forward, and shipmakers weren't able to keep up to the extraordinary surge in demand. But that wasn't really a shortage by traditional terms. It wasn't as though facilities were shut down <coughs> in any sort of major way. There was a little bit of that uh, when Malaysia announced its COVID lockdowns, but it was a small fraction of the shortage. The key driver of the shortage was excess demand. Today, the real challenge for the semiconductor supply chain is political, not economic, because governments around the world are looking nervously at the map of where semiconductors are produced and the extraordinary concentration of chip making in Taiwan, which not only produces, as I mentioned, 90% of the most advanced chips, but has extraordinary chip making capacity that almost nobody can match when it comes to processor chips. And so as governments from the United States to Japan, many others, have begun worrying more about a crisis in the Taiwan Straits, they've also begun, well, I think just begun, to think about the economic ramifications of what it would mean to lose access to right. chips made in Taiwan. And the answer is that it would be traumatic. It's not just that you would struggle to build a smartphone anywhere in the world the year after losing access to Taiwan's chips, although that would certainly be the case. Nor is it that at least a third of PC processors are made in Taiwan and couldn't easily be built elsewhere. It's also all of the other goods that rely on semiconductors household appliances, automobiles, the disruption would be dramatic. A typical car, for example, has a thousand chips inside. Now, only a fraction of those in any given car are actually made in Taiwan, but good luck replacing them in a crisis where the world was already suffering from a one-third reduction in computing power due to a loss of access to Taiwan's chip making. The last two years have seen automakers globally lose $200 billion of revenue because they couldn't produce cars they'd planned to produce. That was in a period of Massive growth in chip supply. Imagine how bad it would be if there was a massive reduction in chip supply. A third of computing power was simply not produced or not able to be exported abroad in a given year. What's worse is that the most frightening fact from the last two years is that the companies that make the machine tools that make chips, like ASML in the Netherlands that makes extreme ultraviolet tools, or applied materials in California that makes deposition tools, both of them announced in the last 12 months that they were facing delays in making their tools because they couldn't get enough chips. We didn't have enough chip making tools because there were not enough chips to put in the chip making tools. And that was with double digit growth and double chip production. So run that experiment forward in case of a Taiwan crisis and I think you'll see the results would be catastrophic, which is why governments are uh, beginning to spend a lot more attention, and a lot more money on right. semiconductors today than they've been uh, over the past several decades. In the United States, uh, there's the CHIPS Act, which allocates uh, almost $40 billion to incentivize more chip making in the United States. Japan uh, is in the midst of a similar program. Uh, Europe will probably uh, soon follow as it outlines the uh, details of the EU CHIPS Act. India is trying to spend its way into chip making in a big way. And all of these government programs are primarily driven by a desire to buy a big insurance policy in case something goes wrong in the Taiwan Straits. To have a bit more capacity outside of Taiwan in case there's a blockade or a war. But there's one part of the US government that is less worried about the economic ramifications and more worried about the military ramifications, and that's the Pentagon. Now today, the, the US military is a small consumer of chips. 
Unlike the 1960s when most ships were going into missile guidance systems, today only a couple percentage points of semiconductors find their way into defense or to aerospace uses. But like the rest of the economy, the US military today is more dependent on ships than ever. Like a car, for example, defense systems have hundreds or thousands of chips inside, some very simple, some at the cutting edge. And so the Pentagon is deeply worried about its supply chains in case of a crisis. But what it's more worried about is that its edge over its most likely rival has declined. Since 2014, the Chinese government has identified semiconductors as a critical vulnerability. Because today, China spends as much money importing chips as it spends importing oil. Every single year, uh, tens of billions of dollars of, uh, of, of Chinese imported chips flow in to build the electronics that have fueled Chinese economic growth. Smartphones, PCs, machinery, consumer goods. And most of these chips are chips that China can't make at home. China's far behind the cutting edge in Taiwan when it comes to chip making. And more than that, it's even further behind the cutting edge when it comes to making the ingredients that are required in the chip making facility. The machine tools, for example, or the materials. China's years or in some cases decades behind where the cutting edge is. And so for the last decade, the Chinese government has been pouring money in probably at the scale of tens of billions of dollars a year, the data is somewhat opaque, into trying to bolster its domestic chip industry. And the goal has been to reduce China's vulnerability to a potential future in which the US was trying to cut off China's access to chips. Because just like how the US would be at great risk if there were a crisis in the Taiwan Straits, from the economic impact due to a loss of chips, so too China would be. And China's got nothing at the cutting edge at home. Far from it. Um, it's, it's multiple generations behind. But over the past decade, China's made some progress. Um, Chinese firms have reached close to the cutting edge for one type of memory chip, which is, uh, which is a fairly impressive accomplishment. And certain types of chip design, Chinese firms have gotten closer to cutting edge capabilities. And what's more than that, until very recently, Chinese firms could buy whatever chips they wanted on the open market and deploy them uh, legally or often illegally into defense systems. And from the perspective of the US military, this was particularly problematic when it came to the types of chips that go into data centers that are used to train AI systems, because inside of data centers are among the most advanced chips that are produced. And although we think of AI as being driven by smart software developers, that's a myth. Actually, AI has been driven by advances in semiconductor technology. You know, ask yourself, have software designers gotten five times as smart over the last decade, or have they gotten access to five times as many transistors? Well, actually more than five times as many transistors. The answer is obvious. It's computing power that has made possible AI. And training AI systems is extraordinarily computationally intensive. If you want to train a computer vision algorithm, for example, to recognize what's a cat and what's a dog, you have to show it thousands, often millions of pictures of cats and dogs before it learns the difference. And that process requires a ton of time in data centers. And if, unless you have access to the most advanced ships, your data centers will work very slowly and it'll be economically inefficient to do so. So the future of AI, in other words, depends right now on access to the most advanced computer chips. And today, the chips that can effectively train AI systems are made by one company on one small island just off the coast of China. Both Chinese and American advances in AI have been enabled by one semiconductor manufacturer. And as militaries, like the rest of society, try to apply semi-autonomous capabilities to future military systems, they're beginning to realize that access to the ability to train AI systems in advanced data centers will be critical to the future of military power, which means that it's a reasonable bet to say that access to the chips that go inside of those data centers could well be a determining factor in which military begins to harness AI systems more effectively. Which is why last year, the US government announced a series of pretty sweeping export controls to mm -hmm. stop China from accessing chips used to train AI systems in data centers. Smartphone chips untouched, auto chips untouched, PC chips untouched, just one type of chip. The type of chip that you'd use to train an AI system data center are now illegal to transfer into China. They're all made in Taiwan, but because they're made in Taiwan using US tools, they're all designed by US companies, they're now illegal to transfer into China. The US government is betting that 
the U.S.-China military competition, the dangerous arms race that we see underway in Asia will be determined by exactly the same component, computing power, that determined the prior great power arms race. They may well be right. If you look at what the Defense Department is buying, they're buying systems that are increasingly reliant on semi-autonomous features. Intelligence agencies are already being transformed by the ability to accumulate lots of data, run it through smart processing systems to get interesting results. The Chinese government is just as interested in uh, autonomous systems uh, in its purchases. And if you think about the components of these systems, the key component is the ability to train the AI. What differentiates countries' drones? Well, it's not really how far they fly. It's not really the metals in their body. The key differentiating factor is the quality of the AI system inside of them. In the past, we've thought about factories as places where metal is fashioned. Factories in the civilian world, factories for military production. But in the future, what I'd like to suggest to you, we'll come to realize that the factories that really matter are the data centers where smart systems are hammered out by chips doing lots and lots of processing. These are the machine tools of the 21st century. And yet the production of them remains controlled by just a tiny number of companies and their manufacture remains controlled just by one company, TSMC, uh, in Taiwan. To conclude, therefore, uh, it seems to me that the struggle to produce computing power, which is the struggle to produce semiconductors, is at the core of the modern world. Uh, whether it's military competition, semiconductors are at the center. Whether it's the structure of the global economy, uh, semiconductors are a key facet of global trade and globalization as we know it. It's not just your smartphone, although you should be very thankful for your smartphone, uh, that semiconductors make possible. In fact, they've uh, structured the modern world, the world economy, the balance of power on the world stage, and the way that arms races happen uh, in the contemporary world, both during the Cold War and in the present day. So, that's my story as to how a historian of Russia came to be interested in semiconductors. Um, but perhaps I'll wrap there and welcome any questions from the audience. Do you want me to moderate? That's fine, yeah. It's up to you. I mean, That's fine. Someone... Yeah, yeah. Please. Uh, thanks, Chris, for a great talk. I thought I would just take advantage of your being a historian and throw you a question that historians Perfect. can <laughs> answer. And that's, you know, like, I'm old enough to, like, think about, um, you know, every kind of resource or technology has been critical to yeah. the military at some point, yeah. right? Access to timber, yeah. to coal, to oil, to rubber. But militaries have always seem to adapt to shortages when, you know, oil fields were taken over, you make synthetic oil. <laughs> rubber fields are taken over, you make natural ru synthetic rubber, like within a year, right? Yep. From natural rubber to synthetic rubber. Um, so what's different here? Like, you know, I was in the military, I remember this hysteria about critical technologies throughout my career. What's different about this one where I shouldn't worry so much about something happening in Taiwan yep. and believing in our ability to adapt? You know, prices would go up, we'd adapt. Yep. So, yeah. yeah, yeah. So I, you know, I think certainly if if there were crisis, would there be adaption? Yes. Um, would it be very costly adaption? I think uh, yes, it would be. Um, if, but if you ask yourself, what's the substitute? What's the substitute for semiconductors? You can have less advanced semiconductors, which is a bad substitute, though it's a substitute. You know, we can we could all adjust if we needed to to a decade-old iPhone. Wouldn't be great, but we could do it. Um, so you could you can adapt by going backwards in time. Um, but you can't really adapt by not relying on computing power. There's, you know, how, how would we go about that in society? We would just revert to life in the 1990s? I mean, I guess that's an adaption of a sort, but it's, uh, it would be a pretty dramatic, um, pretty dramatic adaptation. So it seems to me that this is uh, somewhat different because it's not a product. It's a product that goes into basically everything. Uh, and so timber is important for building ships. You find alternative ways to build ships. But this is something that's in almost every manufactured good. Everything with an on-off switch today, except the simplest of light bulbs, has chips inside. Um, could you find ways to adapt certain use cases? Absolutely. Uh, but it seems to me the scale of adaptation you're envisioning is vastly more difficult uh, than other examples you've talked about. Um, and I, I think I, you know, one of the comparisons is often made is to, to oil. Um, and I think that's, you know, that's a comparison that my publisher has attached himself to for marketing purposes. Um, <laughs> but I think... Uh, I, I, 
I, I think in some ways, oil has actually an interesting comparison point. So Saudi Arabia, which as you may know is a superpower of oil, produces 15, 10 to 15% of the world's oil. So if Saudi Arabia were to you know, be swallowed up by the deserts tomorrow, we'd still have 85% left. Well, if Taiwan produces 90% of the most advanced processor chips, so the concentration is far higher. Uh, than the oil industry. And ASML produces 100% of the world's EV lithography machines. Um, so the level of concentration seems to me, for an absolutely critical good across the economy, uh, really unparalleled. Uh, and I, I, I've spent a lot of time thinking of a parallel, and I really haven't been able to find something that's not just an input to one sector, but an input to basically every sector today. That combination of widespread use uh, and basically monopolization across multiple points in the supply chain uh, does strike me as as pretty unique. Yeah. Yeah. So thanks, Chris. A uh, fantastic talk and a fantastic book. Uh, I mean, re really, really gripping from beginning to end. And I, I wondered if you think of part of the story that you're telling, uh, whether you would like in the future to write a parallel book you know, you're talking about the the, 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 the the chips that are driving the processing of data. Um, and <coughs> clearly the data that is being processed is also an important question mark. Where does that come from? How is it derived? So, you know, in your example, uh, where do you get the millions of pictures of cats from? Yep. Or, yep. you know, it, it, it's particularly acute, I think, in terms of we're used to the idea that China has a unique system of social control in terms of absorbing data about its population that maybe the United States has much less of and Europeans for privacy reasons have even much less of. So could you imagine writing a parallel book on the sources of data and how data works in your work? Yeah, so I, I, I've thought about this a lot and, and I've come to the conclusion that data is much less of a thing, a category, than chips are um, for two reasons. First is that you know, there, there's no such category of data. There's data about different stuff. And so people say, you know, as you alluded to, China's got lots of data. <laughs> what, what, what does that mean? <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> um, and yes, it's true that different countries have different privacy laws, and so you can collect consumer data. But all the consumer data in the world won't let you devise uh, or train an intelligent AI system to learn about things that aren't in the data. So if you've got pictures of cats and dogs, you can't train a computer to recognize cows. Uh, and so in that sense, data does seem very specific to the use case that you're um, trying to learn from. Now, you know, today with large language models, they're able to read the internet basically, and there's a lot of stuff on the internet so you can get a lot of data from that. Uh, but it, it does seem to me that data is much more of a diffuse category uh, than semiconductors. But the second point is that, why do we have so much data? You know, the hard thing, the hard thing to do is to convert sensory information into digits. Because data is something that we can put on a semiconductor and then put in a computing system. And how do we convert analog signals into digits at scale? Well, we use semiconductors to do it. So for example, inside your smartphone, the camera has a semiconductor that converts optical signals, photons of light, into digits, <coughs> ones and zeros. There's a audio uh, semiconductor that converts the sound of your voice into ones and zeros. The, radio waves coming into your phone are converted via a semiconductor into ones and zeros. And so actually it seems to me that uh, if you focus on data, you miss the fact that the reason we have so much data, information coded in ones and zeros is because of semiconductors. And had we not had semiconductors that can convert all these different types of analog signals into data, we'd have a lot less data. Um, and so that's why I think that we've actually overestimated dramatically the importance of data and underestimated the significance of our ability to remember and to process it. And, and that's fundamentally a story of semiconductors. Yes. Well, thank you so much. What a great book. What a wonderful lecture. Three comments. Number one, there is a major investment on a factory in Arizona. Actually, yeah. two major investments. My question there will be, what will be the impact for the whole market? The second one is the chip sack. Apparently, you know, we try to solve part of this problem. What will be the long-term consequence? And finally, uh, is there a chance for parts of the world to be part of these supply chain, you know, near shoring and all these things that are being said, becomes an opportunity, but quite complicated uh, technology in a way to be adopted. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I think I think we should 
we should be skeptical of new countries trying to make their way into the chip market. Um, not because I, I don't wish that they can, but just because history suggests it's very, very hard. There are, are really just three examples of it happening historically. Japan, which really wasn't a late catch-up, it was a sort of late catch-up story, but actually engineers from Sony licensed the first transistor uh, months after the transistor was uh, first released to the public. So Japan is an arguable catch-up story. Uh, and then South Korea and Taiwan. So there's two countries of around 200 in the world that have caught up uh, in any part of the semiconductor supply chain and the rest haven't. So it seems to me the track record suggests it's very, very difficult to break into the chip industry. And what's more, the trend of the last um, uh, 10 years, maybe even 20 years, has not been of catching up but of falling behind. Everyone has fallen behind Taiwan when it comes to manufacturing advanced processor chips. The US fell behind, Japan fell behind, Europe fell behind. South Korea is basically struggling to keep up. When it comes to lithography systems, everyone's fallen behind the Netherlands. Deposition systems, same story. So actually, convergence is not the trend. The trend is the exact opposite because the specialization required uh, is so intense, the capital expenditure is so high um, that it's very difficult for the market to tolerate two players, to say nothing of it being very difficult for a country to start from zero and catch up to the cutting edge. In terms of the, the CHIPS Act and the TSMC investment in Arizona, TSMC is building <coughs> excuse me, uh, two pretty small facilities, medium-sized facilities in Arizona. They'll be what they call N minus one, so one generation behind the cutting edge, uh, which means that uh, they will be a relatively small share of TSMC output uh, when they're online in 2026 or so. Uh, one comes online next year, one comes online in 2026. Uh, so I think they will have a marginal impact in terms of the amount of chip making happening in Taiwan versus off Taiwan, but it's still the case today that TSMC is investing more money in Taiwan than outside of Taiwan. Uh, and so if current trends continue, uh, there will be no reduction in Taiwan's uh, critical role in the industry. Please. How largely was the Taiwanese government involved in Taiwan's monopolization of the chip industry? And how much of that do you see as a reason as to why you know, the US gives it so much protection and why Taiwan may be invested in yeah. it? Um, in order to gain that protection? Yeah, those are two great questions. So in, in terms of the Taiwanese government role, on the one hand, it was deeply involved. It funded three quarters of the initial investment uh, in TSMC when it was founded, either directly from the government budget or by twisting the arms of state-connected business people. Uh, so the, the company wouldn't have gotten off the ground without government funding. Um, on the other hand, TSMC sold exclusively to international markets because the domestic market in Taiwan is so small, uh, you can't build an effective business around the domestic market. And so from day one, TSMC was focused on serving international customers. And what's more, the founder of TSMC, the most underestimated, in my view, business person of the 20th century, a gentleman named Morris Chang, um, spent his career in Texas. Um, he'd uh, built up Texas Instruments transistor production lines, then semiconductor production lines in the 1950s and 1960s. An American citizen held a top secret security clearance for his work on defense systems as Texas Instruments. So, um, and he'd only been to Taiwan previously on business trips for DI. Um, so it was hard to find someone more deeply integrated in the American chip industry in some ways than Morris Chang was. Uh, and so TSMC's story is both a story of a smart investment by the Taiwanese government um, but also a brilliant execution of a business model by a very deeply internationally connected uh, business person, Morris Chang. So it's, 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 a, it's a both, is my answer. Partly the government, but in no small part, uh, TSMC's business model. You also asked about the Taiwanese government's strategy uh, in investing in semiconductors. And one of the arguments that I, I make in the book is that from the earliest days of Taiwan's efforts to attract electronics investment and attract semiconductor investment, it wasn't only about um, advancing technologically or creating jobs, which are things that the government was certainly interested in. It was also about security. And indeed, it's not a coincidence that the first investment that Morris Chang made at TI in Taiwan was in 1969, just as the US was beginning to obviously be losing the Vietnam War, just after uh, Richard Nixon's election as he began to talk about pulling back from Asia. And from Taiwan to Singapore to South Korea, there were political leaders who thought that the electronics industry was both a source of uh, jobs, but also a source of strategic guarantee. Uh, and so there was a, a, a dual purpose uh, from the perspective of governments in East Asia. And the US government was highly supportive, was highly supportive because they wanted to bind East Asian allies to the United States at the exact same time. And so there's great, uh, great um, 
records of conversations between, for example, President Nixon and Lee Kuan Yew of Singapore in the early 70s, talking about the criticality of electronics industries uh, in, uh, in Singapore. Um, and Lee Kuan Yew says, you know, this is going to be central to our job creation scheme, more electronics investment, more semiconductor production. And Nixon says, yes, and it's going to bind our economies together uh, and keep the US and Singapore close economically, but also by implication politically. So there's been deep, link deep linkages, I think, between the economics of supply chains and the politics that they imply. Please. Yeah, uh, so I know you're trying to, sorry. <laughs> I know you're trying to avoid the comparison to oil, um, but I'm curious like how the international market for SEBIs is like structured because I know like over the last 30 years, we've achieved a lot of oil independence in the US thanks to like shelf fracking. But like when an international price shock occurred, it still affected price in the US. Yep. So like, can we really achieve the level of independence that like military leaders or strategic leaders want in SEBIs? No. I think self-sufficiency in semiconductors is a pipe dream. It will never happen. Um, but I don't think that's actually what the U.S. government is trying to achieve. I think um, you, know, you can certainly find uh, uh, bombastic members of Congress who talk about <laughs> self-sufficiency. Um, but I think if you talk to members of Congress who wrote the CHIPS Act, or if you talk to people in the government who are implementing the CHIPS Act, what you'll find is that they're not going for self-sufficiency. They're very happy to see new investment in chip-making facilities in Japan or in Europe. Uh, what they want is a, what they're buying is a very expensive insurance policy in case of a crisis in the Taiwan Straits. So I think you can kind of safely discount phrases like self-sufficiency as just being political rhetoric disconnected with actual policy reality. Yeah. Uh, I want to riff on the, the very first question that was asked about substitution. Yeah. Um, and. Uh, by the way, great book. Um, I was surprised that I had to order it at <laughs> Labyrinth, but now that they have them in stock. Um, that, um, as you stated, uh, it's about computational power, right? That, that everything hinges upon upon that, that more than data. Um, uh, and if I consider that, then I think silicon, and I think the biggest pinch point is ASML. Uh, perhaps is that if that's fair. That's right. For me, the question is substitution. Yeah. Um, assuming that it would take perhaps forever for anyone to be able to compete effectively with ASML, um, and and maybe not. Um, that's that, that'd be one question. Sure. But the, the other question is: Are there substitutions for silicon? Are are are, are computational <laughs> experts starting to look at other materials, yeah. uh, be they organic or inorganic, or yeah. uh, you know, and uh, I know it's a, maybe a tougher question for a historian, but I'm sure you, you're speaking yeah. with people about this. So, so I think so, you know, silicon is one of the most widely right. available uh, um, elements in the Earth's crust. We've got a lot of silicon. Yeah. The challenge is purifying it to the requisite degree. And actually, that's, that's not easy to do, but in comparison with everything else I've described, that's fairly straightforward. So silicon is not, not the limiting factor. There are other materials that you'll use for certain types of sensing, communications. Uh, but in terms of uh, computing, in terms of memory, It'll stay on silicon, I think, for a very uh, long time. And the challenge is not really in the silicon. The challenge is in miniaturizing the transistors further. And silicon is not um, is is not the choke point right now. Um, you know, you asked, are there other things you can substitute to get similar results uh, via different pathways? I think the answer is 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 is, is sort of yes. Um, if you if you don't need to keep up with Moore's law. But what differentiates this industry from all other industries and this technology from all other technology is that in 10 years, you've had five Moore's laws of doubling. And so if you're trying to catch up over 10 years time, you must not only catch up to today's technology because then you'll be five Moore's laws behind. You need to catch up to a horse running faster than any other horse in the economy. Uh, and that makes catch up very, very difficult. And that makes substitution very difficult. You know, it's certainly possible uh, to, um, to make semiconductors without some of the advanced tools that I've described. But you can't make them in any volume. Uh, you can't make them uh, with any yield. So yield is the share of chips you produce that actually work. It's hard to get high yield. And so using other tools, you can make chips with very low yield. But it's never going to be commercially viable uh, or technically viable. Uh, and so I, th I think, the, I think the, the reality is that all of the investment that's gone in, billions of dollars, all of the smartest minds that have been thinking about ways to fashion silicon with ever more precision, the pathway that they found is probably not historically unique, um, but it's one of a fairly small number of pathways that were findable. And to deviate from the pathway 
bear, uh, incurs very large costs, which is why there's not a lot of deviation from the standard pathway. We've been using the exact same tools, just better and better and better and better for 60 years. Are we approaching physical limits, though, as well? Yes. Yeah, we, at some point, we'll approach physical limits. It'll be too small. You can't shrink any further. But actually, <laughs> the reality is that we're still some ways away. So, um, so right now, transistors are measured in um, you know, a, a dozen or so nanometers of the size of their smallest feature. But we're going to start stacking them on top of each other so you can get more density on a given chip. There's ways you can re-architect the chip. There's a lot, a lot of tricks up the sleeves of chip designers that I think physical limits is a problem for the 2030s, not a problem for the 2020s. Yeah. I want to ask kind of two questions. Um, I'm not an expert on quantum computing. Me neither. <laughs> if, so with quantum computing, my understanding is that it fundamentally works differently. So you can achieve computation without using the same science under, underneath of it. And quantum is a ways away. But if we broke through there, could that serve as an alternative to like the uh, semiconductors? And then the second question was, um, I'd like you to talk about the relative uh, dependence between the Chinese and the United States on Taiwan. How effective of a hostage is TSMC uh, for the Taiwanese? Is it deterrent towards the Chinese, or yeah. could they eat the loss better than we could? Um, and would the hostage be less effective, and therefore they'd be willing to sacrifice the factory if they got destroyed in an invasion? Yeah, so on, on, on quantum computing, you know, I'm, I'm far from an expert in quantum computing, but what I will say is from the history of classical computing, what you find is that revolutionary technologies take a long time to play out. Take a really long time to play out. It was a long pathway from the first computer using integrated circuits to the iPhone. Uh, and so I think we should think whatever time horizon it takes us to get the first practical use of quantum computing, which is still not yet achieved, we should assume decades over which that will begin to uh, ripple across society and economy. Uh, in terms of uh, US-China interdependence vis-a-vis -vis Taiwan, you know, I think for, for both countries economically, we can debate how large the cost would be, but for both it would be massive. So I don't know who would lose more, but the cost would be very, very large. Um, probably larger for uh, China would be my guess, because China is more exposed to electronics manufacturing that's relying on chips, but it's a big number regardless. But there's a, there's a second question, which I think you were alluding to, which is political willingness to bear costs. And then there's another question, perception of political <laughs> willingness to bear costs. And there I think there's a lot more uncertainty uh, involved. I don't know which which society in the face of a Taiwan crisis is more willing to bear costs to achieve its goals, United States or China. Uh, it seems like that's an uncertain question that would be hard to really gather empirical data about. So it's this perspective about the future. You can ask people now, but it doesn't necessarily tell you anything about how they'll act if there's an actual uh, crisis. We it's po it's possible to gather data about perceptions of the other of the bo of both sides' willingness to bear costs. Uh, and I do think, if, if I understand you correctly, you're right to allude to the fact that it may well be that Chinese leaders think that they're more able to politically stomach the cost uh, than the U.S. is, and if so, that would be a destabilizing feature of the, of the relationship. Please. What will be conceptually the, the ultimate in, uh, you know, in this technology? Would it be, for example, having things on an atomic level, or are we there already? You know, I think right now the perception is that if you get to the atomic level, it's too small. <laughs> um, but I, I, I will not predict where our physicists and material scientists will be in two decades. Uh, it seems to me the track record uh, is that if you put a lot of smart minds and lots of money into it, uh, you can get the advances that are needed to produce Moore's Law. Um, but right now, the perception in the, in the industry and in, um, in academia is that physical limits will begin to apply once you get too small. But we're some ways away from that right and now. too small is the atomic world. Probably even less small than that. Yeah. Please. Thank you so much for being here. It seems that your book more or less tells the story of brilliance of individual innovators and success perhaps triumphalism of market dynamics and competition with some exceptions of government convention and uh, Taiwan's strategic thinking about hosting this uh, TSMC. So then my, but then my question to you is based on your study on this subject, what is the right balance of the government intervention? Like for example, this constant, the level of concentration yeah. on Taiwan perhaps was a mistake on perhaps US government or other governments part for not thinking about 
potential crisis, you know, when Taiwan Strait Crisis happened in 95, 96, yep. or like later on. So to, uh, based on your say, what is the right balance of uh, state private balance? And um, and then what's, the, and if it's, if the situation is different now than, you know, uh, U.S.-Japan competition in the 80s, yep. uh, are we going in the right direction with the CHIPS Act and with increasing level of uh, government intervention? Yeah, so I, I think I, I would try to break out government intervention into multiple different categories. Um, it seems to me if you're trying to catch up, if you're starting out with low technology and trying to catch up over a pathway that's already been defined, the history suggests that government intervention can work. Taiwan is an example, South Korea is an example. Now it's worked in particular where you've got very small domestic markets where there's never a discussion of focusing solely on the domestic market because it'd be too small. And so companies have to export from day one. And so the export market provides the market discipline. But the combination of government support plus export market discipline appears to have worked quite well in both Taiwan uh, and in South Korea. And that's there's an industrial policy literature beyond semiconductors that is suggestive of that. But if you're in the United States or the Netherlands or Japan, you're in a very different place because you're close to the cutting edge, not at the cutting edge. And the pathway forward over 20 years is just very unclear. No one knows where things will be in 20 years. And so in that context, I would say uh, I would not bet heavily on um, the government to choose the best product in, in 20 years' time. And I, I'm struck by the example of Bob Noyce, one of the co-founders of Fairchild, and one of the two people uh, who, um, uh, who held the patent for inventing the first integrated circuit. And he, uh, he made Fairchild uh, a viable business by selling to the military. So he was fulfilling government contracts uh, for the first couple of years at Fairchild. But he was always focused on making that a small part of his business and instead selling to a much larger consumer market. And I think what made uh, him and that company so successful is the ability to compartmentalize in their mind the need to sell for government contracts now just so they had money coming in the door with the vision of selling to a vastly larger consumer market down the road. Uh, and for, for Noyce, he had a great quote that he gave to a um, a, a interviewer in the 1970s, he said, venturing is about venturing. You want to take the risk. Yeah. Uh, and, and that was fundamentally not something uh, that you do in government contracting. Right. Um, and, and I think there's a bit of uh, greed and ambition behind his story. I, I think you know, Noyce knew that uh, no one ever became a billionaire by selling contracts to the government. Uh, and I think that, that, that realization um, was a driver for uh, for many people in Silicon Valley. So there's a, a complicated mix, I think, between the places where government clearly has played a big role in boosting certain countries' industries, and a place where it's been an enabling factor, but uh, necessary but not sufficient, if you will, uh, in the U.S. industry. Now there's a third question, which is uh, security issues. Do we think that companies are rationally calculating mm. around Taiwan risk? Well, I think the answer is no. Um, my sense, yeah. at least until very recently, is that in CEOs' mental models, uh, their probability of a blockade or a war in the next decade was zero. If you, if you pin them down, they might say it was 10%, but they put such a low number on it that they didn't have to take any decisions around it because actually it's a really hard problem to deal with. If you're Apple and all of your production is in China using chips made in Taiwan, you know, if someone tells you the probability of war is 20%, what do you do? Uh, and so for a long time, they, they, in their mental models, put a zero on that probability. And I think there's a role for government where it's pretty obvious that the probability is unfortunately below zero. I don't know what it is, but it's not zero. And companies hadn't been adjusting fast enough. So that's a, a different problem that I think government does have a role in trying uh, to help resolve. Chris, uh, just one, one question. One more? Sure. Just one last question. Perfect. Yep. Uh, as Intel pours money into like a, an Ohio plan and TSMC into like Arizona, what needs to happen from like a human capital standpoint? Is the U.S. ready to support all these factories? Um, it seems like our immigration system right now is pretty pretty bad, at least for a lot of the tech industries in general. Yeah, I mean, I would agree, I would agree with you on that. Um, I think. I, I think it's an issue. I think it's a challenge. Uh, we've seen a lot of universities actually already begin to, to change where they operate. So uh, Arizona State, which is going to be right next to the TSMC facility, is already expanding their semiconductor engineering, Purdue and Indiana. Um, so I think we actually see a lot of response to the problem you've identified, but I agree that it is uh, certainly a, a big challenge. Thank you so much.
one thing I always tell students, you know, look, looking for research uh, topics is like picking the right question is the most important <laughs> thing. And, you know, I think uh, Chris just sort of uh, yeah. maxed out on that and, 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 and then obviously did a terrific do- job uh, answering that question. So really a terrific uh, yeah. talk, terrific book. Uh, and thank you all uh, for, for coming. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks so much.